Good morning, or at least this morning here. I hope you're here to learn how to set healthy boundaries and not stuff, not build barriers. Barriers in relationships actually destroy relationships. I, uh, I love this. I'll show you this. All right. This little chipmunk. Communicate on stuff, relationships lost because we choose to stuff, push down our feelings, run, hide, avoid. But what that really creates is bitterness and anger. You see, when you're building re barriers and you're avoiding people and you're collecting retaliation rocks, as Lisa Tucker says in her book, Becoming Unglued, you're not ministering. Actually, uh, one of my friends said, yeah, when we stuff the devil, he's going to be puffing, right? When we're stuffing, he's puffing because he's like, yeah, I got it. I'm won this battle. I don't know. But as we dive into this, uh, I, let's look at why do we stuff our emotions? I'm guilty of this. Okay, so let's just open this up with knowing right off the bat, I'm a stuffer. Okay. And when, as I was studying this, God really revealed to me um, some things that I did and do, I'm going to work on. And so don't think that I'm just pointing my finger at any of you because really, it's for me. But let's look at why do we do this? Why do we stuff our emotions? All right. Well, look, here are some things. You don't feel safe. You don't feel confident to approach the person that you're having problems with. You don't have energy or the time. I've heard people say, I just don't have time to deal with this right now, right? You don't know how to address the situations. Maybe it's something that you're like, I have no idea what to do here. Or maybe you don't want to seem hypersensitive or dramatic. You know, the person, oh, they're dramatic. Yeah. You don't want to get rejected. You don't want to lose control. You like, Look, if I go to that woman one more time, I'm going to hit her. I'm going to lose control. I'm going to be in jail. So funny. So that is dramatic, right? I don't want to get things, make things worse. So I convince myself I can let it go, but you really don't. And sometimes this is, oh, this hit me. Sometimes it just feels more godly to stuff. You know, it's not. If it's not done appropriately. You see, we think that it's more godly to stuff because we've heard scripture like this all of our life. Look at this. In the multitude of the words, there wants not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Yes, that is true. If you refrain your lips and you can move on. Or how about this one? A raffle man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeases strife. strife. All those are true. And those verses are true. And those verses are some of the ones that I've used in my past to kind of validate stuffing. But you know what happened? I stuffed those emotions, but the bitterness did not go away. You see, the bitterness was still there. You see, I felt like I was keeping peace, but by being gentle and quiet, non-confrontational, that's spiritual, right? But could I do it without harboring bitterness most of the time? No. Saying you can and doing it is two totally different things. You see, how do you know that you're bitter if you keep talking about it? You keep dwelling on it. You keep uh, thinking about it. And anytime somebody like mentions that person or mentions that situation, you're going to throw up on them. Just like, blah, 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 blah. well, let me tell you what I, you know, that's bitterness. That's not God honoring. And that happens so much in everything, in our families, in our businesses, in our church, in our workplaces. We begin to build those teams, you know, those, uh, our side, come to my side. Let me tell you what, how, what they did to me. And I want you to be on my side. Oh, they did that to you too. Okay. We're going to be on a team. That is so not right. So convicting. It is. So I look at this slide here. Look at this one. So there's a big difference now in harboring bitterness and building healthy processing. We want to get to healthy processing. So we can get to the point where maybe we don't have to do all those things. But what? how do you do that? Well, first, you've got to work through the issue. And you've got to diffuse the hurt in your heart. you got to pray. And you say, okay, God, 
give me verses, some of the verses that we've talked about, some of the things that we've already discussed and the Lord healed my hurts. You know, go back to those scriptures. Sometimes you have to go to a counselor or a mentor. Sometimes you just have to vent it out. It helps me to just sometimes go to someone that I trust and say, look, I just need to vent. And when I get finished venting, as I'm venting, I'm working through a process. Sometimes you have to take time and you you step back from the situation. You realize, wait a minute, that's not a big deal at all. Oh, here's the big one. Take ownership of your part. You see, if there's hurt feelings, there's two parts to it. Either you perceive something that was wrong or you did something that they perceived that was wrong. Something's going on. So you need to take your ownership. So how do you know when you have reached success when hard feelings are gone? But you know that there's failure because your feelings have gotten stuffed and you have bitterness. Hmm. Barrier building. Hmm. Look at this house. Can you see the house there? You see, by av- by avoiding confrontation and by stuffing, you're building barriers like this house. Now, if you look at that, what is that sending? What message is that sending to the people on the other side? Don't come near me. I don't want to have friends. I don't want to resolve this at all. It's inside barriers of bareness. See, by staying in what we call humble silence, this is kind of how you're looking right here. This is, this is kind of how we're looking. And that destroys relationships. Maybe that's destroying your family. And ultimately, who wins in this? Satan. Yeah. Because by doing this, uh, what you're doing or what I'm doing is giving off this persona that uh, don't bother me. I'm building barriers. And I do that, honestly, because I'm protecting myself from hurt. Hmm. Something to think about. Right. So labels that help you know if you're barrier building or labels help you know that if you're bitter, you say things like those people, they're so demanding. They're hard to talk to. They're difficult. They're selfish. They're just volatile. They're defensive. I'm just tired of people making excuses for them. Why can't they just learn to be different? Uncaring. You see, then when you begin to say things like that, you become blind to their good things, their good points. Mm, I'm guilty of this. Yeah, because then you're hyper-focusing on their bad. And so anytime anything comes across that even appears to be bad, that's what you're going to attack. Because you're not about building a relationship. You're not about, at this point, reconciliation. You're all about of building your barriers, collecting your retaliation rocks. And God is not, God is not honored in that. Especially, and we're talking here mainly about Christians, two believers that are in a dispute. Now, when you're in a dispute with a non-believer, it's, it's, an, it's a different situation. Because then you have to take in consideration their heart is not full of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you have to handle them differently. And we've talked about that in, in some of the other videos. But we're talking here predominantly with Christian against Christian problems. Okay. So that's the, the one thing there is you begin to focus on there. So you need to ask God to help you to begin to focus on their good qualities and Uh, help you to start seeking a uh, resolve of the conflict. You know, this is true. I love this. I'm just going to go back to me, but you know, this is true when you're doing this, especially when you have like teenagers or like middle school or like fourth, fifth, sixth graders in your home, because they're going to begin to hear and pick up. They're really smart. Uh, they're going to pick up and hear that you have a problem with this one particular person. And then you're going to hear them start saying things that you're saying. And in essence, you have created a barrier. I see this all the time at school and it kills my heart. 
Because I'm trying my best to pour into this student. My peers, teachers are, are trying their best to pour into their students. And you have this one parent who gets upset with one of us over something, you know, minor, silly, you know, too much homework or, or you know, something that we did in class that they weren't particular, things that we've assigned for their homeschool day that, that was too much, whatever, okay? And so they get together and they talk about it with other parents and they begin to tear down that teacher and tear down the school and tear down what we're doing. And next thing you know, I have kids coming to class or my friends, a teacher friends have kids come to class and they're saying, well, my mama don't like you. And their grades begin to go down. Um, their attitudes get really nasty in class. And I have to stop and say to myself, what is going on? And when you start probing and you get the parent in there and you get, because then inevitably another parent's going to come to you and say, hey, so-and-so is really dogging you at the playground. Or they're really talking about you at, uh, at the park or after school when they're done. Their they're really, they're really dogging you. And it's burdening my heart because you're, you know, you've really made a difference in my kid and I don't know what to do. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. And it happens in churches all the time where, you know, people get angry in a committee meeting. And so they start building their uh, barriers and they start, you know, doing their thing. And next thing you know, uh, if that kid's teaching their, if that person's teaching their child or if that person is doing something, you're looking at the bad. And what you're doing is you're building barriers and you're collecting rocks. And those little people that are behind you and those young people that are listening to you, you are teaching them to do the same thing. And you're hindering ministry. Now ask yourself, Landa, ask yourself, who's winning? Satan. Because the strife and discord quenches the Holy Spirit. And you may be praying for a lost loved one, or you may be praying for like a child in my class, or, or I might be doing something. And this little petty stuff that hasn't been confronted and addressed has caused division. And the Holy Spirit has been quenched. And the very thing that you're trying to pray for, your prayers are not getting answered. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. And, and this, is, this is up to me too. And it breaks my heart. Because this is, I'm convinced this is one of Satan's main tools right here in our churches and in our lives. Let's look at this, this right here. The difference between boundaries and barriers. So maybe this will help you. Boundaries set relationships on a progressive course. Learning to set these positive boundaries up front. Learn to be upfront and set boundaries early in relationships. So there's no, there's open transparency and no pre preconceived ideas. But first, you see, before you set boundaries, you've got to realize and know what you truly want. What do you want? What do you need? Naming what you really want and need, writing it down, helps you to focus on solutions and not rely on emotions. Establish good, positive boundaries and move to the mindset of improving yourself, not just proving myself. I had to learn this. Oh my, so many of these things. I was the world's worst at not setting clear boundaries, not communicating what I need and what I want. My poor sweet husband. I remember our, our uh, I think it was our second or first year of marriage. I'm not even sure when in our marriage. Um, my love language is thoughtfulness, uh, gifts. That's my, that and words are two of my big love languages. And it doesn't have to be an elaborate gift. It just has to be something that you, that's thoughtful. Uh, something you put thought into. It really means a lot to me. That's why I have, little joy boxes full of little trinkets and things that kids have made me and cards and stuff and just random stuff. If somebody looked at it, they'd be like, this is a bunch of junk. Well, no, to me, it's pretty special because there's a story behind it. There's a thought behind it. But he got decided to get me a fish filet and knife for Valentine's Day. 
you know, let you know, a fish flaying, electric fish flaying. I think it's like electric knife, but it had a, is a special attachment for flaying fish. Now, that would have been great if I was a fisherman. That would have been great if I cleaned fish. That would have been a super gift. But the problem with all that is I am not, I mean, I like to fish occasionally. I'm not like anti-sportsman because, you know, I'm, I was raised in the country. I mean, we, we fished, I, whatever, but that's not something that at that point in my life I did regularly. And um, as far as that goes, I didn't need that piece of utensil. But for Alan, who did fish and who did do all the cleaning of the fish, he felt like it was needed because he needed it because he cleaned all the fish for me. <laughs> so needless to say, my perception and what I wanted and what was not, it was not a good Valentine's Day for him at all. And I had learned that I had uh, through many counseling situations, it was during... Um, <laughs> Actually, I remember now, no, I had children. So we were living in Georgia. So we had been married quite a while. And it was during a very hard season in our marriage, actually. That just came to my mind. Wow, it's amazing how things like images come back to you all of a sudden. I had just had uh, Rebecca. So I was going through postpartum, still in kind of postpartum depression. It was not a good time in our marriage, right? And here he gives me a fish fillet knife. But you know what? I hadn't communicated with that sweet man. I had to learn through counseling um, to communicate and not set preconceived ideas, to set some boundaries. And I did. I told him, I said, look, huh? you would have been better off to have got me my favorite 50 cent at the time. Now it's $2 candy bar and wrote me a love letter. And I would have been over the top excited about that. But a fish fillet enough. And he began to realize himself. And we had to do a lot of searching and setting some boundaries and being clear. And I learned to tell him exactly what I needed and not to put unrealistic expectations on him because that was not fair to him. And he learned uh, to do the same with me. Because, see, I was just as guilty as he was. You know, what was his love language? How was he feeling? He was an acts, of, he's an acts of service dude. And so I had to learn that he needed me to do certain things for him. And that made him feel loved when I cleaned out his truck or if I'd sneak him a cup of coffee and put it on his desk before he got in the study or, you know, prepare him something special to eat and have it for him. These are things that he really appreciated. But it was the difference here is I could have continued to set up barriers and got angry and bitter and destroyed our relationship. Or I could start communicating and, and being clear with what I needed and what I wanted and been in boundaries. Now, that works in all relationships. If someone is saying things to you that you don't find appropriate and it's tearing you down, then you need to learn to not stuff that emotion even if they're an adult and you're a younger person, but they're older than you, and you need to go to them in a kind way and say, look, I know that you don't mean that the way you're coming across, but I'm on a self, I'm setting some self boundaries. And I need you to know that you don't have a clue what I'm going through. You don't have a clue about my past. And when you say things like that, it really hurts. And so I'm going to need you not to do that. And if you choose to do that, then I'm going to pull away from you because that's how, what's healthy for me and my boundaries. And if I have done something to make you feel like you need to come with me at that, then I'm sorry. And I need you to tell me what you need from me. But I'm standing up for myself so that I can be effective because I want us to have a relationship and I want us to be, uh, you know, productive for Christ. But if you keep telling me those things and if you keep telling and saying things like that to me, then I'm going to pull away from you because you're hurting me. You know what I've learned when I do that to people? They're in shock. They really didn't mean it the way it came across, across and they apologize and they begin to see their eyes are open and they begin to see I've had one or two that they're like, well, I didn't, you know, whatever. And I've had to say, I've had to pull away from them in my life, toxic relationships that I've had to, you know, remove myself and that's okay as well. 
So setting those boundaries, not barriers. Keep that in mind, right? So how do you, hear some questions to help you when you want to resolve it. Will you help me understand why you feel this way? Can we stick to this issue? Don't pull past issues back into this. You know, one marriage counseling thing says is when you and your husband have a conflict and you ask for forgiveness and you forgive, don't break up that past, let it go, right? That's a relationship killer. What is the desired outcome in this situation? How can we meet in the middle? Okay, here's something. What is something good that's coming out of this issue? Start asking yourself. And what do you need from me? And what do I need you to understand that I need from you? It's called communication. Instead of fighting, you call it growth opportunities, right? Lisa says that in her book. She's said her and her husband now call it, instead of they've had a fight, they say, oh, we've had a growth opportunity. I like that. I thought, yeah, that's so cool, isn't it? Growth opportunities. Here's all that unrealistic expectations. When you don't, when they don't meet, people don't meet your expectations that you've set on them. You're either going to explode or stuff. And that is your problem. That's not their problem. That's our problem that we got to work on, right? <laughs> so I don't know. So how do you keep from doing this? Let's look at these things. What does the Bible say about resolution? It has to say quite a bit. It tells us in Matthew that you need to go alone and directly talk to the person. If that doesn't get any results, go with two or three other people, a non-partial person, somebody that can help you navigate, you know, if you're having a problem with that. On your part, if there's hurt there, there's a problem. It's not silly. It's not dramatic. If somebody comes to you and they want to discuss, excuse me, then you need to not look at them as being dramatic. You need to say, oh, there's really hurt there. And I need to be long suffering and I need to listen and see what's going on. Uh, speak truth. Your perspective is not necessarily the whole truth. It's just what you perceived. It's what you saw. It's what you heard. It's how you took it. And so you need to speak truth in what you feel and they need to speak truth and you need to come to an understanding through the grace of God and then be quick to forgive as Christ forgave us. You need to be quick to forgive. Let's look at the scripture. In Matthew 5, there it is. Let me look at the scripture then. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, you're supposed to leave it there and go thy way to be reconciled with thy brother. What does that mean? That means if you've got ought get someone if you've got hard feelings or bitterness towards someone and you're trying to worship and come to the altar and worship God you aren't you're not going anywhere it's not going anywhere because you've got to go and get that right with your brother first and you're like well what if they don't want to reconcile then what I do you go to them and you do the best you can and you try to uh release the hurt as humbly as you know how, and you keep on. And if they keep rejecting you and, and you take two or three people with you and you do the next step and they still reject you, then you may have to, uh, the Bible actually says go before the church and say, look, they're still doing this. But if they're truly a Christian and you're truly a Christian and you both are involved in whatever it is together, then you should want to reconcile, especially when you have a mentor a spiritual mentor or someone go with you because hopefully they're going to be able to say, Hey, look, you guys have got to get this to a point. You don't have to be best friends, but you've got to get this worked out so that the hindrance of the Holy spirit will not hinder your worship. Will not hinder the church. Will not hinder your workplace. Will not hinder your family. You got to get this to a good point where you're not building barriers. You're not talking about each other. You're not being bitter. You're not um, reproducing rocks. And that's, that's got to happen. The next one, look here. Um, we see this one a lot. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, you have gained a brother. Go to him. Communicate. That's what we've been talking about here, is building boundaries and communicating, not barriers. 
Look at the Matthew 18. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or more or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. You want to take people with you so it's not a hearsay thing. And so you might can get this thing worked out. We call it the Matthew 18 principle when I worked at um, Tri-City Christian School. Mr. Templeton had that um, thing. He said, don't come to me. Come to that, go to that person. And, then, you know, Matthew 18 principle. Now this kind of stuck with me, right? Have I always done it like I should? No. And I've had to pay for it. That's what I'm saying. I, I don't, you know, wrap it up. Here we go. Seven tips to avoid stuffing. Take the initiative to resolve the conflict. Focus on goals bigger than personal differences. Focus on what Christ needs to do in your life. Why is Satan wanting you so upset about this issue? There's something bigger that Christ wants to do that this is hindering. So start focusing on the bigger. Listen attentively to their perspective. Let them speak first. Validate them as a person, their feelings, without minimizing their concern. And then try to really pray through it in your spirit while you're sitting there. God help me understand. Then tell your story. Don't blame. Be honest yet kind. You then may need to apologize. Ask forgiveness. They also will need to apologize if needed and ask for forgiveness. Discuss ways to avoid future conflicts. Set good boundaries if needed. Right? Setting good boundaries. You know, this whole thing uh, has sparked me. A good friend of mine, uh, Gloria, has she told me about a book called Boundaries. And I've ordered it. It hadn't come in yet. But I'm excited because I know after studying this that this is something I need to work on. Setting better boundaries with every relationship in my life. Communicate. Set boundaries. Humble yourself. Desire to resolve and not stuff. Look at Matthew 6.33. What is that? Seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not seek ye first, Landa, who's hurt you and the situation and this all this junk. No, no, no. That's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to stay divided so that he can get in and he can cause havoc. That's how churches split. That's how Christian schools are destroyed. That's how um, places of work have, oh my goodness, have like 10 people working in an office and only two are talking. It's, what a toxic workplace. That's how families don't talk. That's how families are divided for years and years. Did you know that my grandfather and his brother were neighbors. But for the last 15 years of their lives, they were lonely. They lived by themselves. Now they were neighbors, literally neighbors. They would sit on their front porches. They did not speak. For the last 15 years of my papa's life, over 12 inches of land. sad to me. Barriers. They could have been such friends. They could have been such comfort to each other. Neighbors literally could have walked to each other's front porches, set together, but 12 inches of land, the bitterness, the anger kept them from that. Help us, Father. Help us to lay down our barriers. Help us to throw away our rocks. Help us to lean upon you. Focus on the greater things and seek your kingdom first. Mm. I love you, sisters. I'll see you next time. Have a great day.